I'm going to be talking about the world of art and design, which is, which is what I've been working on recently. So I'm going to start with showing you a slide. So in the 2016 um, Kochi Biennale, I was walking up the stairs of Aspenwall House to one of our galleries on the top. And um, a family stopped me and because I, you get these blue tags when you're part of the Biennale. And when people see those blue tags, it's always dangerous what comes at the other end of it. But they stopped me and said, Biennale Nano. So I said, yes, I'm from the Biennale. And they pointed up to that ceiling and said, is that an artwork? So, um, so you know, I, I, I took a minute. What you're seeing on the screen here is, is basically um, a work by a, an artist called Lan Tian Tsi. So just bear with me. What he was trying to do here, it's called Stray Dogs Barking, um, Ceiling Fans, Burj Ali. And the idea that he had wanted to convey with this setup is about you know, mysterious sounds and movements you feel where you don't know the source of the sound, but you can feel its sensation, you can hear the sound. So imagine, for instance, you can hear a barking dog, but you don't know where the dog is. Or you can hear the sense of a ceiling fan, but you can't see it. Now, I could not explain all of this to this family while I was standing over there, so I said, yes, of course, it is an artwork, because why would we have eight ceiling fans in one spot? And then I pointed them out to the, what we call wall text, which is supposed to explain the artwork. So I pointed them out to that, and then I, well, walked away very fast. This is what they would have seen on, um, on on that text. I mean, I'm just going to take one second to read this out. Agavum puravum tamile idanariyaya chedane yude ee andarichatil preda bhoodangal undu. Lantian chi yude ceiling fan, um, stray dog barking, burjali enna srishtil, srishtil moonu tharam preda bhoodangal aan ulladu. Ningalkum idanariyile madilugalkum idayil adrishyamaya chalaga shakti yaanava. So I am going to leave this out for interpretation among each of you. But basically the idea that, I mean, basically what I'm trying to uh, point out here is that over the years of working in art and design, one of the biggest comments I have heard, and from very successful people, is that they don't understand art. And, um, they, and what I mean by design here is, you know, when you look at a room like this, everything that you're looking around you is a piece of design. The pencils you write with, the pens you write with, a piece of paper you write on, your clothes, your tags, the design of the stage, everything is a piece of design. Um, art, on the other hand, which is, a, which, is, which is imagination in reality, is again a part of an aesthetic discourse which often befuddles people. And some of the most successful people, success in finance, successful in many other forms of life, get mired in confusion when it comes to art because they are not sure what they're looking at. Now, what that usually means is they know that they're looking at something that's supposed to mean something, but they don't get it. Now, there are several reasons for this. One of the main reasons is, is art speak. The art world writing that you see around you um, all comes from Western, Western forms of painting. So we have historically always used language that has come and referenced Western painting. So words like surrealism, um, abstract, you know, all of these words have come from Western classical painting and moving on to now conceptual art. Now imagine if you were, and for us, those of us living in the East, when we think of art, we look at murals, we look at Jamini Roy, we look at Raja Ravi Varma, we may even look at MF Hussain. But we are used to dealing with spiritual art, we're used to dealing with art that references courtly paintings, we're used to thinking about art as being, um, you know, miniatures, things like that. So imagine now you have a school of thought that's completely alien to us, writing that's supposed to make you understand it better is confusing. 
Um, and then imagine if you translate it into a language like Malayalam. It's a bit like sort of Mohanlal once said, you know, communication of the interior um, democratizations, if you know the movie that I'm referring to. So it's a very confusing thing. And throughout history, art has always been elevated to this space of intellectual superiority. So you imagine that if somebody is from the art world, someone engages in the art world, someone collects art, then they must be somehow more evolved as a person. But art in itself cannot survive without the public. It has no purpose without the public. If you do not have people who are not trained in seeing art, um, who are not able to engage with art, then art simply has no purpose. If art is only bought by the capitalist, appreciated by the intellectual, and you know, promoted by the philanthropist, if people like us do not engage with it, it has simply no purpose. But an art is an industry. It is a bought and sold commodity. It has always been a marker of wealth. People who could afford to commission art artists have always commissioned artists in order to display it. So if that is how the, and of course, I mean, as I said, the language of art criticism and art writing is so confusing. Um, you know, it's as though a secret society has put this material out, but they don't actually want you to be a part of their group. So it is a completely alienating experience in a way to be reading this material. So then what happens? Do we even really need to, un really need to understand art? Do we really need to engage with art? Yes, of course. Why? Because art, at the end of the day, it offers a way for us to see the world. I mean, if you think of Jesus Christ, the images that, you, that come into your mind are the images that da Vinci drew. When you think about the pantheon of Indian gods, the images that come to our mind are actually the images that were put out by the Raja Ravi Varma press. So art enables you to visualize things that you otherwise didn't even know you needed to visualize. Can you visualize pain? Can you visualize joy? Can you show what these things will look like if you were to embody pain in a, you know, in a piece of poetry, you know what that would sound like. But to embody emotion in an, a piece of art, it allows you to imagine things. And believe me, these things also translate to science, to math, to many, many other streams. And today we think of fonts as very, being very integral to any presentation. Everybody has a font that they prefer. So, but the, so that's the beauty of art, that it enables you to think out of the box in anything that you are doing. So if we are all going to be replaced by machine learning and AI in the coming years, the only thing that the human mind can do, which machines so far cannot do, is to be creative. And people since the time of cavemen have been creative. I mean, human beings are the only species that have the capacity to imagine, to dream, to doodle for no particular purpose except to doodle. I want to show you um, a piece of artwork. This is uh, artwork by an artist, a very famous contemporary artist called Subodh Gupta. In the early 2000s, Subodh, who is from Bihar, took elements of middle class Indian homes and blew it up into large scale installations. So a giant aluminum bucket, a scooter, um, scenes of dirty plates, these mundane elements of our existence suddenly take on a space of art because suddenly they are embodied with meaning. It signifies many, 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 many things. It signifies hard work. It signifies, to some extent, in some cases, drudgery. It signifies a certain way of life. And suddenly, this becomes a piece, an op more than an object, more than just a practical object. It starts to have layers and layers of meaning, and therefore becomes something that symbolizes our very own existence. Now. So that is why it is important. But how if you are not trained in the language of art, how do you approach art? So we know that it is important to be able to approach art, but how do you do it? Now, 
In 2009, while I was working at a news magazine in Bombay, one of my colleagues was put to a, a, a task which today seems a little bit tacky, but it was the kind of thing that journalists used to be asked to do. So and the editor asked one of my colleagues to get um, a street child to the National Gallery of Modern Art and ask him what he thought of paintings that were hanging in the gallery. Now, like I said, this might seem like a weird thing to do today, but it is, in his defense, it is in the realm of great academics in the art world have taken children to see masterpieces, to understand how they view a masterpiece. And it was very interesting. So this, this boy, his name was Suresh, he was 12 years old. Um, he used to sell books, pirated books at a street light near the NGMA. And there were a couple of paintings that struck out for him, but the two main paintings that struck with him. One was um, Jesus Christ, Christ on a Cross by Jatin Das. The other one was about a mango seller by an artist called Giv Patel. Now what he said was, he lived um, on the steps of the, near the steps of the Mount Mary Church in Bombay and identified himself as a Christ follower. So for him, of the plethora of paintings in that gallery, the thing that struck to him first was the Christ painting. The second painting, we would all interpret that painting in a particular way, but in his mind, that boy was actually selling a mango to an adult and trying to prove that it tastes good. Now you can imagine that much of what he interpreted of these works has been taken from the way he lived his life. Now 2016 Biennale, the curator Sudarshan Shetty um, titled the edition Forming in the Pupil of an Eye. His logic was that we all see the world in the way that we are shaped by our experiences and, by, and therefore we have multiple realities that each of us viewing the world views it in our own way. And therefore, 20 people in a room have 20 realities of, every, of the life around us. And therefore, that all of art is really an interpretation of what you see. Now, Alice Steger, who's an artist at the last Biennale, his installation, Pyramid of the Exiled Poets, you may have seen images of this work, was one of the most popular works at that edition. Now, what the artist imagined of this work is as a monument to exile poets who had been arrested in various parts of the world. And so it was a monument to being a, you know, people in exile. But the people you see in front of these works, and inevitably the lines were filled with just normal people who came to see it, their experience of the work was completely different. For them, the experience of the experience was more important than what the work was actually about. So in a way, right there you have two or multiple realities and multiple interpretations of a work. And for them, the experience of going through this pyramid, of hearing the voices, of reading the poetry, and also of experiencing that environment was really the reason that they would stand out in the hot sun trying to get in to see this. And what that really tells you is that it is most crucial simply to engage with a work. It isn't really important to understand it from the perspective of the artist. What is most important, you know, if you see 300 works of art in a, in a, in a public exhibition, you might react to five, and that's fine. It just makes the viewer more discerning. There is an impression that one needs to understand every single one of those works from the perspective of the artist, but it is simply not possible. All reactions to artwork are valid because all reactions are from the perspective of the person viewing it. And we are all, we are all influenced by the experiences we have, just like that little boy who sees a work from the perspective of his own worldview, that is exactly how we all do it. That is a very valid way of approaching um, artwork. Now, and we don't realize it, but the fact of the matter is that every image you see around you, you may go to an exhibition, you may like a few paintings, you leave the exhibition, you forget about it. But every image you see, every space you are in, that leaves a mark on your, 
on your imagination, leaves a mark in your mind, can be interpreted in a completely different way elsewhere. The clothes you wear, what you eat, the paint, the color of paint that you use on your walls, all of these seemingly random decisions that you make and your taste actually comes from the things that you have seen, the things that you have read, and the references that have been filed away in your mind. And which is really why the seeing of things is in itself so important. The seeing of design, to look, to look at the things that, you know, a room like this is filled with mural paintings. To be able to just stand in front of it and look at it, we may not understand it, we may not know the meaning behind it, but simply to look at it. Because you do not know when those combinations of hues, th that painting would be part of a decision-making process on something completely different, maybe on the selection of a piece of furniture at some point. We don't know. And over time, practicing the art of looking is what has worked for me. I'd like to show you two people that have made an enormous difference in my worldview on design and art. One is this individual, he's an architect called Bijoy Jain. He heads up Studio Mumbai, which is a, a design practice out of Bombay. And Axel Vervoet, who is a Belgian designer. Um, both of these individuals believe very much in the, material, in the importance of materials. Um, and especially Jane's work, who has worked in sustainable architecture for a long time, really goes down to what is important in terms of sustainability, what is important in terms of um, sustainable architecture, but also in terms of materials that are being used in India today. And every one of us, and the reason I point out to these people is that every one of us picks these influences from the people that we like, from the people that we um, encounter, from the people that we read about, and use that to form our own aesthetic worldview. Nothing is accidental. The way we dress, what we, none of these choices are accidental. They are all decisions that are formed and will change over time. Each of, you know, a person in their 20s, a person in their 30s, a person in their 40s, these things will all change. But the, the thing that I would like to leave you with is just the fact that it is not important to understand um, art or design, but it is important to engage with it because without your realizing it, it is making an impact on you and that impact will be translated at a point when you may need to make a decision on a certain thing and therefore it doesn't really, I mean, it doesn't really matter whether you get it from one person's point of view. It is changing you and therefore it always, always matters and usually it changes you for the better. So. Thank you very much.